This is the Average Guy Network, and you have found Home Gadget Geeks, show number 202, recorded on February 5th, 2015. T-minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, all three engines up and burning, 2, 1, 0, and liftoff, the final liftoff of the class. Here at Home Gadget Geeks, we cover all the favorite tech gadgets that find their way into your home. News, reviews, product updates, and conversation, all for the average tech guy. I'm your host, Jim Collison, broadcasting live from the AverageGuy.tv studios in a very, very, very cold and blustery Bellevue, Nebraska. And, of course, we post the show. I came back from Florida with eight inches of snow on the ground. That's oh, it's no. a little chilly here in Nebraska with world-class show notes out at TheAverageGuy.tv. If you have questions, comments, or contributions, of course, you can contact the show. Send me an email. Jim at TheAverageGuy.tv. You can track me down on Twitter. Just That's just at Jay Collison. And of course, you can call in those questions, 402, in here in the U.S., or use your Skype number to get around that, 402-478-8450, and we'll play your questions right here on the program. Of course, TheAverageGuy.tv is powered by Maple Grove uh, Partners Web Hosting. Get secure, reliable, high-speed hosting from people. You know, because you know Christian, he runs that uh, over there. For, the, for more information, of course, visit Maple Grove Partners, all one word. Dot com And, of course, uh, Home Gadget Geeks is a part of the Geeks Network. You can find the links to this show and uh, many other really good podcasts out at thegeeksnetwork.com. You can join us in chat, watch or listen live on YouTube, listen to the audio on Spreaker, and now on Mixler, and, of course, find all the navigation that you'll ever need over at theaverageguy.tv. All right, well, we, uh, we're kind of back into interview mode, and uh, we've, the next couple shows I've kind of lined up are around that. I have uh, Peter Hudson here with us. He's with BitLit. And, Peter, thanks for taking uh, some time to, to join us tonight. I appreciate you having and having you on the show. Oh, it's a pleasure, Jim. Um, glad to be here. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we want to dig in a little bit. BitLit, I found you guys on Twitter. I think this is how this how this happened. I saw something on Twitter, and I, I liked it. And I dug in a little bit. I'm like, this is kind of a really cool concept. And, and BitLit is just like it sounds, B-I-T-L-I-T uh, dot com. So, Peter, take a second. First of all, before we dive into BitLit, let's learn a little bit about you. So how about a little bit of your background, who you are, where you came from, those kinds of things? Sure. Uh, I can tell you that. Um, where do we want to start? I grew up on a daffodil farm on Vancouver Island. Nice. Um, but then I went and did an engineering degree, founded a company, founded another company, which is now BitLit. Um, and it was all based off an argument I was having with a friend of mine. Really? So you're a serial entrepreneur. Right. I guess you call me you call me a serial entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. And what? So what was the argument that you were having? The the argument I was having. I was out for for dinner and drinks with a buddy of mine named Dan, and we were arguing about I think quantum mechanics and superposition <laughs> and the nature of free will. And uh, why would I think we were actually arguing about whether free will could exist in in a in a parallel universe world where all universes are multiverse out, and if we could build a sufficiently powerful quantum computer, would it be possible to model this? And Dan has an eidetic memory, his brilliant memory, and he had just finished reading uh, Stephen Wolfram's book, A New Kind of Science, and he said, uh, on page 750 of Stephen Wolfram's book, uh, on the top left-hand side, second paragraph down, there's an argument that would perfectly articulate why you're such a moron. Um, I, I can see where that book is on my shelf right now. I just wish I had the ebook copy on my phone so that I could prove how wrong you are. Now, at that moment, both of us kind of snapped and we're like, yeah, you should be able to format shift your physical books into digital books. And, you know, you could do that with a CD, no problem. Like you put it in, ripped it, you got your MP3s out, Bob's your uncle. But you can't do it with a book. Um, there is actually a project called the Do-It-Yourself Book Scanner, and you can go to do-it-yourself with dyibookscanner.org. And it actually does have, you know, something that you can actually 3D print out, and it will flip pages for you in two SLRs, and you can actually run the dewarping software, and it'll OCR it. But this is a nightmare. This is not the same as a CD-ROM. Exactly. Um, a little more work to that. A little more work to that. that. So we, we started more. thinking about this idea. Could we solve it? And, and that's where the idea for BitLit came from. And so BitLit really is this ability to, to go in and uh, take a picture of your existing books. And then uh, you guys, uh, you, you attempt to find them, and I'm going to walk through this in a little bit more detail, but you attempt to find them and then match them to their e-copies or, or what's available on there. So let's talk, let's, let's go back and, and as we think about this, kind of walk through the process of, of so someone, it all starts, I assume, at this point when they download the app on their iPhone or, or Android device. Um, you had mentioned your Android first because it's got a lot of features. Why Android as opposed to the iPhone? 
it it was not of any kind of particular bias one way or the other. My co-founder and I um, were Java and Scala developers, so we like developing on that platform. The advantage of Android is that you can push something live on Google Play and it's there within an hour, whereas you don't you have to wait seven or ten days on iPhone to, to push an update out. So it's just one of those, well, we can do things faster first uh, on Android. So that's kind of what we do. Yeah. So it made more sense from that standpoint. And, and so yeah. if you're using Android, I think you're going to get a little bit more uh, you were showing me in the pre-show just a little bit more functionality or at least a, a different kind of look and feel to it. So for the average user, uh, they're going to pick up, and I've got a bookshelf of, of books behind me. We scan those into the pre-show, uh, so we'll talk about those here in a few minutes. But is it really so that the, the user downloads their app, they're going to log in either using Facebook or Google to, to get in there. And You had mentioned you really like to know who they are. Why, why is it important that you know who we are in this case? So the way we make this happen is you're not actually so much, you are taking pictures of your bookshelves and taking pictures of your books, but you don't have to scan every page. What we do is we go out and we actually hustle the publishers because the ebook assets already exist. Someone already has the EPUB file for the books on your shelf. Uh, so we have to go out and we have to hustle them and say, look, are you willing to give away a free or insanely discounted ebook to somebody who can prove they own the physical copy? And the twist of how you prove you own that physical copy is that the publisher wants you to write your name onto the copyright page of that book and take a photo. And what we don't want is the word, the name Seymour Butts or IP Freely showing up on, um, on any books getting returned to Barnes & Noble. So that's kind of the, that's the key. And have you had, so have you had people trying to trick the system as far as doing it that way or would just I, to be funny? Just to be funny, we've had people try and trick the system. We've been, we've appeared on Slashdot a few times, and you know there's you know you know Slashdot th threads as well as I do. The first thing that will come up is how can we break this? <laughs> exactly. um, so yeah, and that's so that's that's come up. Um, and there certainly are ways you could try and cheat the system. If you were if you were insanely motivated, you could put an acetate sheet in. You could write your name on top of the sheet. Mm. But at, at the same time, if you're super motivated to get a digital copy of a book, you could probably find a torrent site to get the book from. Yeah. Yeah, so it's really, it's like locks just keep people, or they're just for honest people, right? Yeah. At that point, there's always a way, ways around it. So when you say, so I have a book, one of our Gallup books, first break all the rules. So mm -hmm. uh, what I need to do, if I own it, then I'm going to put it on the copyright page, which is generally, is that is that then, that's the one that's got the author. It's going to be hard to see this a little bit, but yeah, is yeah, that, that the one that, that has be, the author that on the it? Page. Yeah, that so it? that would okay. be assuming that we had signed Gallup as a publisher who was participating in this program. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So assuming, so I take the picture, I see that first break all the rules is in that list. Yeah. And this will be interesting for me because I've, I've, I work with our publishing team. And so uh -huh. after probably tomorrow, I'm going to go <laughs> in and say, Hey, have we thought about this? So, um, uh, so I would write my name in that and then I would, uh, well, first of all, I'm going to scan it in, right? Let's, let's talk a little bit about that. You want me to take my phone, go to my bookshelf and start taking pictures of my books. Right. Yeah. So what we needed to do is, so we've signed deals with about two, I checked this morning, it was 283 publishers. So we've got 80,000 different titles that we can bundle for you, but that's still a reasonably small percentage of an average bookshelf. So you need a way to find out which books on your shelf are eligible because generally speaking, you won't know the publisher of your, of your books. So that's where the shelfie photograph comes in. So the first thing you do, you download the app, you sign in, and then it instructs you to take a picture of your bookshelf. So you take that shelfie image. And for that, you can probably get 20 or 30 book spines into a good sized shelf and you take the shots. And what we've developed, my co-founder did his PhD in computer vision and he developed some very clever computer vision algorithms to slice the bookshelf up into individual book spines. And once we have an individual book spine, we actually read it using OCR and we wrote our own um, OCR algorithms to do that. The standard ones only tend to work with black text in nice fonts on white backgrounds. Um, so we're, you know, reading nasty text, nasty fonts off distorted bookshelves. Is, let me, um, before you yeah. before you go farther, because that's like what you're doing is like really different, right? I mean, from an OCR, OCR has always been terrible. Are you guys yeah. fixing that? I mean, kind of with your own stuff. I hope I hope you're getting maybe a patent on or something. Because this <laughs> OCR is typically really terrible. Is this a new way of doing OCR? It is one of the newest ways of doing OCR. So we use a, a deep convolutional neural network for this. Uh, so this is kind of the bleeding edge of computer vision is where we're at. In fact, the training our neural network, which has something like two and a half million neurons in it, we actually had to GPU accelerate it. And we have to run it in real time on a GPU accelerated hardware. 
Uh, otherwise, now, it won't I, work. In, we were talking about this in the pre-show. I had no idea. You're running this on Amazon, and they have the ability now. I mean, you can run GPU processes on Amazon. And that's got to be – is it pretty expensive? I mean – it can't it's, be cheap. It's not too bad. It's not too, too bad. Uh, the, the instances they give us aren't terribly powerful, but the, we probably pay about 10, 10 to 25 cents an hour for a single GPU accelerated server. We actually had NVIDIA donate some hardware to us. Uh, so we had an incredibly powerful Tesla 40K card in order to do the training of the network. They just gave us a card that said, make sure you mention them if you ever talk about what you're doing. So you just fulfilled that. I, I just fulfilled my <laughs> obligation to NVIDIA. Very nice. I'll have to get a link to that so I can go in the show notes as well. So, um, so I'm. So you've got new technology. We're taking pictures of the book. You're recognizing the spines, and so you're doing that in a little in in a different way. Very processor intensive out there, going and mm -hmm. trying to figure out what those books are. Uh, I did that uh, here earlier. Let me see if I can bring that up now on the iPhone, and that's kind of what I took this on. And you'll be able to see some of this if you're looking at the camera. So. It, it's got a copy of some of the books that were on my bookshelf, and you can see here. Took about I took a pic, this picture in the pre-show, so it was about oh seven fifty-five Central Time. It's now eight fifteen, so uh, that twenty minutes uh, or so, and I'm a hundred percent back. And it's not like mm -hmm. take a picture and boom, they're all there. It's got to go back. Talk a little bit about that process. So it takes the picture, goes back, runs this intense OCR process. What else is happening there? So in the OCR process, the first thing, segment into individual books. That's probably on a given shelfie, that probably takes us about a minute of CPU time. And then on, depending on how many segments, how many book spines we pull out, we're running OCR using this deep neural network on each one of them individually. And again, there you're probably 20 to, 20 to 40 seconds per book spine to sort of extract out the letters. And the challenge there is we may extract out about 60 or 70 percent of the letters but we're not going to recognize them all correctly. So even then, we're still going to have to match n-grams against a database of kind of the 15 million books that have ever been printed and see if we can find a good match. Uh, so that all is very computationally intensive, which is why it'll take, you know, 5 to 10 to 15 minutes, depending on the load, um, of, uh, of, of server time. Now, the whole thing gets queued up. We actually got hit by a Lifehacker article just before Christmas. And uh, I think we had 30,000 shelfies come in in about six hours. The, the queue length went to kind of 24 hours at that point. It was it, it got pretty ridiculous. And, and maybe so that's maybe where I picked you guys up because it, it went a little viral and I might have seen that in mm -hmm. one of my feeds or so and and I went oh because we're always looking for kind of new interesting gadgety web based stuff to to talk about here on the show. About every other show or every third show we do an interview or I try to do an interview like this. And so that may have been, might have been around that time. I, I, I booked you on here. I didn't really come back to it till this week. You know, it's like one of those guys is like, oh, I'm going to have him on the show. I better figure this thing out. So <laughs> maybe it's good that I waited and let the queue go down a little bit. We had really good processing time tonight. Like I said, probably 10 or 15 minutes it, it went through mm -hmm. the books. Um, and so it, it lists them, and I get an opportunity then, right, to kind of approve or, or say, yes, this is the right book or no, it's not. Yeah, so I mean, occasionally we're going to screw up the, the OCR. We're going to find, you know, you know, we're going to read a bunch of letters off the book and it's going to be a close match to something and we can't discriminate. We pick one of them, it's wrong. So you can send it back. Uh, and then the system actually gets smarter. The more time, if you tap on a book spine and it's wrong, you say try, try identification again or send back. That actually helps our algorithm get smarter because there is a feedback loop. Uh, and so the more popular books probably get identified more correctly, they, they, more often? Than... They do, yeah. Okay. So, the, you know, the Harry Potter books, we're getting pretty good at identifying Harry Potter. <laughs> I bet you are. Well, you know, so there was one when we first did this, there was one it didn't identify, and I clicked on it and said it was wrong, and it went away. But here's an interesting, um, so here, you probably can't see it in the video, but I'll put that up there. There's two books that are together, yeah. right, in the picture, and they're listed twice, and it got them right both times. So it identified them separately. Uh, one's called Ordering Your Private World, and the other one is called the Microsoft MS-DOS 6.2 Upgrade. That's a pretty new book. Well, that, that's an oldie, yeah. <laughs> that's, I, I got some classics books back have, there. Books have good shelf lives. <laughs> they do. Well, I keep that around as a joke because when yeah. we're talking about – sometimes when we're talking about new technology, I just pull that book out. But So while the picture has both of them in there, mm -hmm. it identified them both. So that got them that's, – that's pretty good. And then yeah. there was another one called uh, Generous Orthodoxy, which it had not identified correctly the first time. And when I said no, it went back, and the next time it pulled it in. 
Is there any rhyme or reason to the order that they show up here on, on my screen? There's no real rhyme or reason to that. We, the next iterations of the app will have sorting and those sorts of sort by author, sort by pub date, sort by title. But right now, it's probably just the order that it's coming out of the database or the order in which they, they got in there. I don't think there's any okay. rhyme or reason. So to no it. rhyme or reason. And congratulations, you identified the Bible too. That's a uh, ah, yeah, that's on well. my uh, it's, it's on my shelf there. They did a nice job. <laughs> um, and that those letters go. So does it matter? I mean, most you know most books the letters go this way. In this case, the letters go the other way. Is that this a is, difficult thing to do with this OCR? This is part of why it, it takes so so long to actually run it, because you run it through multiple scales, multiple orientations. Uh, so you're you're hitting it, and you, when you get two book spines, we're doing recursion on this. So that if we detect half of the books or detect one book in there, let's sub-slice it if we can again see if. So that's why there's a significant amount of processing time involved. Yeah, and so we also sent back. Um, oh, where to go? We also sent back the Power of Two, which is one of our newer books, and it came back with that correct again. So as I look at these, they're all they're all 100%, uh, including uh, Dante's Inferno, which happens wow. to that's I'm a wide wide variety here. Dante, wide the wide. Bible, Dante's Inferno, Gallup. You're doing well. Yeah. You're so doing very well. It's, uh, it, it's, uh, okay. So I've got this, uh, list of books, anything from a listener standpoint, anything else they want to know about this before we start looking into see if they're available? Um, I guess that's, that's more or less it for now. I mean, the, the, the best thing I can sort of suggest is that if, if listeners are listening, um, at this point we, with only 80,000 titles, I mean, I know 80,000 is a large number of titles. Uh, it's still a reasonably small percentage of an average bookshelf. So if you want to find the hits, it really is an Easter egg hunt. Take the shelfies of all the shelves that are there if you want to find a hit. And one of the nice things is now those, those books, your books are in the app. So that as we go and sign those publishers, we push you a notification saying, hey, we didn't have this book before, but now we have this book. Would you like to get the ebook copy of it? So how can we, as, as you know, app users how can we help you with the publishers is there a way we can say if it's not there can we write the publisher or what helps you uh, we it, there is actually a function inside the app let me just see if uh, i bring it up um there should be a button there on the list uh that if you tap on one of these guys or maybe we took the want function out maybe that's only on android now there used to be a button there that used to say want i want this book specifically yeah, there we go. On Android, I don't know if you can see it. There yeah, is tilt it just a small. Oh, hold on, let me let me bring you into focus. So it's I gotta find my mouse. One sec. Okay, go ahead. There we go. Yeah, okay. we can see it for sure. Yeah, there's a want button there. The other thing that's nice on the Android version is that the queue looks a little nicer. So you actually see which books came out of which shelfie photographs and how many you got. And uh, those this might be a, so. This would be a cool app. I was thinking. So I'm in a used bookstore. Right, I mean, I'm a lover of books. I'm a used bookstore, and I could buy the book in theory, maybe get it cheap. Yeah, uh, I would own it, scan you it, and see if you have the awesome. e-copy of it. Absolutely. Do, and then I would get, and, and if you do, if you guys do have the e-copy, you talked about free or reduced pricing. Let's talk a little bit about that when we think about once I find the book, and then we're going to talk a little bit about how the discovery works and how we buy them. But how is it how is it brokering those deals and who gives them away for free and who charges ridiculously low prices for them? It's kind of a combination of depends. I mean, I'd say the people who charge you generally have more gray hair in the publishing suite <laughs> uh, than the ones who will, are willing to give away for free. Um, right now, I think the breakdown is forty seven percent of the books we offer are free and fifty three percent are paid. Now, of the books that are paid, you're typically getting, I think I did the average, it was 82% off what you'd pay at Amazon. So when we say significantly reduced, we mean significantly reduced. In fact, we won't let a publisher list books on our service unless it's 75% off the digital list price. So we just don't consider that to be an appropriate bundled price. And I, you think about that from your perspective. You're not willing to probably pay 50% again to get the ebook copy of something you already own. When you start to be paying, I mean, Wiley just signed up, uh, and they've gone ninety percent off. So, you know, if a book was a hundred dollars, um, you're paying ten bucks to get the ebook copy. I mean, that's a hundred dollar ebook, so probably a two hundred dollar print book. Mm -hmm. uh, so you're getting a significant deal. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so it varies. You you got you guys have to broker that deal with them. Who goes free? When when is it to their advantage just to say it's free? The ebook's free. 
So in, when the ebook goes free, there are kind of two reasons that the publishers will go free. One of the reasons would be to actually promote the sale of the print copies. Because what it does, by offering a free bundle ebook, you're effectively increasing the perceived value of the print copy. So these guys, this is an example of a book. This was actually a New York Times bestseller um, this, this last summer. And they actually print on the book. Um, you includes a free bundle ebook. Uh, when you get when you buy the print copy, and they've gone so far as to actually print on the copyright page uh, a little spot for us, or a spot for you to write your name. So for those guys, the motivation is um, is to increase the perceived value of the print copy. Now the second part of this uh, the consideration is when the bundled ebook is free, the publisher gets your name and email address. So that's the consideration of the transaction. You get a, a free bundled ebook and the publisher gets your name and email address. And you might think, well, okay, why does a publisher even care about what my name and email address is? And there's this really interesting sort of um, situation playing out in the book selling and publishing market right now. And that in ebooks, at least, in America, Amazon really owns the space. There's no effective competition in the digital book space. And what that means is that Amazon can throw its weight around. And we saw that happen last year between Hachette and Amazon. Now, Hachette's not a small company. They are the second biggest publisher in the world. They own about something like twelve percent of all books on everybody's shelves are Hachette or their imprints. These guys are enormous, and when Amazon is pushing them around, you know that Amazon can push anybody around. So it's one of those situations where the publishers are saying to themselves, "The reason we are being pushed around is because we don't own the customer. Is that we don't know who our readers are. You know, if I've got a best-selling author, Stephen King's coming out with his next book." We have absolutely no way to inform all of those millions of people who've read Stephen King's books over the years that they can, in fact, go and get a new Stephen King book. And so that's that's the motivation for publishers is yeah, to no, give away that, the free bundle ebook and find out who their audience is. That makes total sense. We're in the same, you know, Gallup uh, where I work is a uh, we we publish and sell a few million books every year. And uh, and we're we're coming to that realization too. It's just not about selling books anymore. Uh, we want to know who the customers are, and we're we're generating a pipeline of books that will be coming out over the next four, five, six years. We mm -hmm. want all those customers to know there's a new book out, right? We want to establish, and so we've moved in a direction to provide e, uh, not just e-books, but web components to the books, so they can come in and get log in and get more value out of the books on a website mm -hmm. component or something like that. So we're really trying to make that piece kind of interactive. I had some interns last summer that came in and wrote a, a web component to one of our books that will allow people um, to have this interactivity and get a, a added extra value. It's free with the book. Uh, you come in, mm -hmm. but um, it was kind of a cool concept. And so uh, I, I totally, uh, as you say that, I'm like, oh, yeah, it makes sense. We want to keep track of the customers and be able to to mm -hmm. uh, to sell back to them and say, hey, there's another book that's out there. So yeah, there's a next, there's a next book coming out. Yeah, that makes that makes total sense. Okay, so we've got the books in here. And mm -hmm. then, uh, in a, a, for me at this point, then the next step, uh, so they're in there, and when I swipe over, it says I have no eligible, in this this case. Yeah, so on your shelf, no right you had no eligible books. Yeah. So take, you'd have to go and take another shelfie, because basically okay. what that's saying is of those, I think, 21 books or something that was in mm -hmm. your shelfie, we didn't have anything that was eligible, which is interesting, because you said you had Dante Inferno in there. Yeah. which should show up as, uh, as a free book. You should, in fact, just get that in a completion email. We should give you the EPUB because mm -hmm. that's a public domain work. So anything that's public domain, we just give you. If you have a public domain book, so it could be that um, there was a mismatch on our end between what Maybe we can So should I retry the So in this case, I clicked on, and I get some options. that says retry identification. Yeah, okay. retry the identification okay. on that one. See what happens. We'll see if it comes back. It, may, uh, it may, in fact, pump back uh, a Dante's Inferno EPUB to you. It's one of those books that, you know, you okay. get for three dollars, right? I mean, it's not the, it's it's not the. Uh, oh, actually, that's, somebody a, that's a nice English copy. Book. It's library bound, library bound. Yeah, no, yeah, and it's got we'll, we'll kind of the pages thing. that are, you know, oh, yeah. um, oh, interesting. My boss, I forgot my boss gave this to me. Um, <laughs> so uh, he wrote a nice note to me. This is one of the things we do at Gallup. So he. It had some meaning to something he was doing, so he wrote me a nice drop in there and said, Jim, thanks for some stuff, and gave that to me as kind of a reminder. He's a big book reader, and so he gave me the book uh, as it. I would say it was one of those reprints, you know, certainly that, 
that came out mm-hmm. a gift book you'd buy it is a gift at a gift book store so we'll send that back in and see if it uh if it comes up the other books yeah you know so a lot of those books that we had human sigma first break all the rules power of two strength finder those are all gallup books so it doesn't mm-hmm. surprise me at this point we're probably we haven't done we haven't done that yet. Gallup Press probably has not uh, done that. I have to talk to Seth about that. Uh, I'm going to show uh, this to our publishing guy <laughs> and say, "Hey, Perfect. what do you think about?" It? He's super progressive. He's not. He doesn't come out of the book, you know, the book industry. He's kind of oh, okay. kind of bringing a nice, fresh approach, and we're doing a whole bunch of things differently than we've ever done before. So. I wonder if I've got uh, Gallup in the CRM. I wonder if anybody's hustled them. If they haven't, you know. Yeah, well, going, uh, I'm going to show him the podcast. I'm going to say, hey, Seth, Perfect. take a look at this thing. Uh, this is interesting. <laughs> you don't have to do anything right now, but, but um, you know, you might want to think about it. So if I did have eligible books in there, so let's say, mm-hmm. uh, the, 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 at the point when it's, it would, I assume it would bring those books up at that point and then give me an opportunity to either claim them for free mm-hmm. or purchase them. That's right. So, but in order to actually purchase the book, so this is this is the next step. Like we know we know now that you have that book on your bookshelf. But we don't know that that book is yours or that you're not going to return it to the bookstore. So this is the second step in the book or a step in step in the process where you're asked to actually write your name on the copyright page of that book and take a photo of that. So you don't have an eligible book on your shelf, but I could actually I could show that process on my end if you think that would be Yeah, worthwhile. that'd be great. That'd be great. All right. Let me, let me kick let the me, camera over to you so it stays on you. On. Let me uh, let me just grab a book here. Um, this is a great little one. This is like my little travel book. It's super thin, so I can uh, I can always have one with me. All right. Let me. Um, okay. So how do how am I going to do this? Um, well, you're figuring you know, that out. Let me let me uh, say. Um, you know, let me click, click. So I I logged into Android, and by the way, you're right because I used my Gmail account. It went yep. it logged right in, which was very cool. Perfect. And so there's there's the example. Let me click it over to me so that I can see that. Okay. So there. Oh, I'm on the wrong one. Hold on. Maybe <laughs> one second. Oh, shoot, I'm getting confused between my phones. All right. I wasn't ready. I'll flip it back to you. Go okay. ahead. All right. Let me uh, let me kind of show the process here. So if I've got my thing up, I'll click Add, um, and it's going to bring it up. Now I need to take a shot of this book. It doesn't have to be super well aligned. Um, but you want to get a, a cover shot of the book like that, and then it's gonna it's gonna be I, trying to identify that book. And we've got this thing called we call it the dancing rhombus or rhomboid. Where we try and figure out is there in fact a book in that frame? If so, what book is in that frame? Uh, is it available? Um, and I'll be honest, that animation is really just covering the upload time. So the fact that we're streaming a podcast right now might make this a little slow. <laughs> it um, gives the reader a feeling that something's going on, right? Yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay, so got it. So in computer vision terms, what we've determined is one, there's a fingerprint. So we're extracting what are called uh, SIFT or SERF uh, key points. They're scale invariant and transformation invariant. Um, and we've got the homography. We know that you have that book. Um, but it says, so this one's free. It would cost you 10 bucks normally. But you get the ebook for free because you own the physical copy. And then it says you got to write your name on the copyright page. So I've already done this on this book. So there's my name nicely written on the copyright page. And you want to use really nice handwriting when you do this because oh, we've got to. So you just don't want to sloppy to sign it. You want to actually write, keep, print it nicely. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? Print reasonably nicely and kind of in somewhere where there's a little bit of free space. And then we're going to scan up and down that page. And what we're looking for here are things like the ISBN, the page curvature. Um, if uh, your handwriting, obviously, in your name, uh, make sure no one else's name has been written there. Um, and this is where you know the flash is ignited. So if anyone's bringing an acetate sheet and putting it in on top because they really don't want to deface their book, um, that's where we do that. But you know what? If you really don't want to write in your book, I completely understand that. If you're a bibliophile, you don't want to write in your book. What you can do is you can order yourself uh, these things called ex libris stamps or a book plate, um, which are these, you can get beautifully designed ones that have your name and a bunch of artwork and it says from the personal library of Peter Hudson and you can stamp your book because I think a lot of people just don't want to have their messy hand. I know my handwriting is brutal. Anyway, so that's... And so that's you'll recognize, st- you will recognize oh, yeah, those we'll, stamps. Oh yeah, we'll recognize I've seen those. I've seen a lot of those. Okay. Yeah, they're really cool. So yeah. at this point you can click finish. Um, and that guy, it, it'll finish. You can tweet about it if you want, and we, we appreciate that, but you really don't have to. 
And then we actually send you an email, um, and I should have one within a few seconds. Uh, if I go to my email. Um, yeah, Rennie in the chat says he has one of those stamps. Oh, brilliant. There we go. And we'll give you the ebook, and you can download it in, I'll try and get this so it doesn't glare out, uh, all of the formats. So you get the PDF, the Mobi for your Kindle, and the EPUB. And I'm on an Android device, so I'll just tap EPUB, and it'll download it for me. It'll open it in whatever the default reader is, so I can read it right away. So do I read it in, the, in your app, or I read it inside my reader app that's, that's on my phone? You, you, can, you can't read it inside our app. We haven't built a reader yet, and because we thought, you know, if you're already using Play or you're already using iBooks, might as well continue reading there. There's no real point. Yeah, that's so. why reinvent the wheel there. You guys have plenty of Precisely. other things you've reinvented. <laughs> <laughs> Precisely. Or, or made better, I should say, not, not necessarily yeah. reinvented. Yeah, so that's, that's how it works. That's very cool. And um, and then that's that that book is mine. I mean the the um, the e, the e version is mine to use. It's legal. It's you've negotiated that with the with the the booksellers, and it's a, it's a mm -hmm. great way. How many? So how many customers or how many um, how many users do you have at this point? I think the the total downloads at this point is sitting somewhere just north of twenty thousand. So it's still pretty new. I mean, we're still a reasonably small company. Uh, we only launched uh, we launched the first version of the app about 12 months ago. We only launched the shelfy bit, that that bookshelf scanning thing, about five months ago. So it's really really new. Uh, we're kind of on the bleeding edge of of making technology actually work. And so new business, new technology. Uh, it's awesome, by the way. I I mean I think what you guys are doing. I mean you're doing some really cool nerdy geeky stuff behind <laughs> the scenes. This is more. I mean you've taken an outdated industry. And you're doing some yeah. great things with it to make it very, very convenient for people. I mean, that that's one of those kinds of things. And, you know, for the book person who's thinking, man, I got all these books on my shelf. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, I want to read them. Uh, I want e -re e you know, read the e-version of them or whatever. I think, um, well, you just put your finger on something right there. Like, I don't know how many books I actually have on my shelf I haven't read. Like, you have books on your shelf that you, you know, I've never actually got around to reading them. And, well, you were saying that on your flight back from Florida – you got overnighted in in where Atlanta because you missed your flight. Right. If you had your personal library digitally with you, all of a sudden you're not never stranded without a book. Yeah, it's it's there. Does this work on Kindle as well? So I assume once I've got the email and it's attached yeah. to me, I right ebooks Kindle. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you can you can push them onto the. So we give you the Kindle format, which is the I think it's called the Mobi format. The EPUB works on everything else. Okay. And you know that is not something I've personally gotten into on ebooks. I'm a big pod since I'm a podcaster. I listen to a lot of podcasts, <laughs> right? Is I, I kind of choose to do that. Uh, along those lines, have you guys thought about the the you know the audio book format on this as well? In other words, if I have the physical book, will I can I get rights to the audio book? That would be amazing. I, and I totally think that would be the most incredible thing. The, one of the challenges is around that is obviously for us hustling, hustling the publishers to get them to sign up to this. Um, typically, it's a lot easier to get a publisher to sign up if they own the rights or if the author owns the rights to the print and digital, which is usually the case. But when it comes to audio, often the audio rights are sub-licensed out. So they're owned by somebody who had no participation in the print sale. So they're kind of they're a lot more reluctant to sort of start giving away free audiobooks to people who bought print books because they didn't see any part of that print sale. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. it might be a good space when we think about Audible or whatever to come in and partner mm -hmm. and and say, hey, you bought the book, we'll give you fifty percent off if you precisely right type deal. And I think that would be a good deal to mm -hmm. to especially to entice folks to get that connectivity to it and and so you guys kind of provide the discovery front end. And say you might have people who've got all these books, and now they want to listen to them, you know, the they audible version of them. Yeah. And I think there's an advantage there from a publisher and author's perspective, because ultimately, as an author or a publisher, you're interested one in selling the book, but you're also interested in actually having the person read it or listen to it. Because if they don't read it or they don't listen to it, they're never going to talk about it, and they're never going to drive referral sales on that same book. So anything we can do to reduce the reader friction. Yeah. No, it's it's bringing a little bit of fresh air to kind of a tired, you know, when we think about books mm -hmm. and 
there, we're in this weird spot with with books again. You know, I I on the way back, I uh, I listen to mostly podcasts on there. A lot mm -hmm. of books have gone that way. Lopped in chat, he says he says I listen to a lot of podcasts and almost no audio books. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of in that same boat too. I have not jumped on the audio book bandwagon. Uh, okay. I, I'm kind of a I'm, since I'm such a tech junkie, I, I listen to a lot. I get my I get all that news and all that stuff I would normally maybe read. I get that from other people talking about it, which gotcha. I don't know what that says about me. But it, it's uh, <laughs> it's 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 where it's where we land in 2015, right? At this point, um, yeah. from that standpoint. So no, very cool. So anything else, uh, Peter? As we look at this, any other components or things we didn't cover that uh, that, that are interesting that I, we might be missing out on? That's pretty much it for now. Um, what we're really focused on kind of as a company going forward is adding more publishers as quickly as we can. We have a lot of very exciting deals in the pipeline that I can't name names on yet. Um, but hopefully the percentage of books on a shelf increases dramatically kind of in the next month. Fingers crossed, touch wood. Um, and, and yeah, that's, that's really where we want to go. Cool. You guys are in, in uh, Vancouver. We're in Vancouver. I got to come to Vancouver and go skiing. I just you, you do have British to, Columbia maybe, or Vancouver, maybe. Washington. We're in Vancouver, British Columbia. Yeah, but skiing, I'm skiing. sure, and either one of them is good. I mean, you got Mount Rainier, I guess, near Vancouver. Uh, the no, other British Columbia would be a lot better. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Um, but not this year, man. We're being hit by a Pineapple Express right now. That you can smell the the tropical leaves in the in the rain we're getting. <laughs> Yeah, so that yeah, no it's a lot of rain, a lot of rain. Uh, I think Utah has been good this year. Colorado's getting some good snow. We have eight inches out on the ground here, uh, which isn't bad. I mean, it's not great, but uh, you can't do anything with it in Nebraska. You just kind of look <laughs> at it. And, uh, and even Trouble cross country up. skiing is not very good. So, um, so along those lines, so you're, you're in Vancouver. How many, uh, so how many employees in, in there? And how do you, are they all tech? Or I imagine do you have some that are just, Working with publishers, how does that work? So we we kind of split the company down the middle. We're a pretty small team. Uh, we are seven people total. So so um, so if you literally if you send an email to the info ad account, it's coming it's coming to my inbox. Um, so how many hours are you putting in a week? <laughs> Let's talk about uh, that. I don't I don't even want to count. I mean, it's 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 ridiculous. I, I had my first holiday in I went actually was down at the Sundance Film Festival oh, nice. um, in Park City in Utah. I took four days off. And um, and the only reason I actually took those four days off is because my laptop got run over by, by a car <laughs> the first day I was down there. <laughs> it was brutal. Though. It's good. It was, but it was, but it you was thrive on this, right? I mean, I, I totally thrive on it. I yeah, love it. Yeah, yeah. So I, in terms of our team, we're split more or less down the middle. So we've got about half of the team uh, is dedicated towards content acquisition. So basically, picking up the phone, calling publishers, trying to convince them that you know bundling and being reader friendly is what they should really do. And the other half of the team, uh, my co-founder did his PhD in computer vision up here at UBC. So actually, you know, um, you know the iPhone panorama thing? Um, that was actually uh, Marius, my co-founder. His PhD supervisor invented that. Oh, really? It's called auto stitch. Yeah, so um, both uh, Marius and our other engineer, Sancho, they both did their PhDs in the computer vision lab at, uh, at the University of British Columbia. And I was able to convince both of them that they didn't want to move to Silicon Valley and work on self-driving cars. Uh, that instead they wanted That's to stay gotta in Vancouver. Be hard. That's got to be hard. Stay in Vancouver and we're going to do books. And we're going to do books instead. We're going to do cool computer vision problems in books. But it does mean that you get to mountain bike every day after work and you can ski after work. So, you know. That would be awesome. Gives that and takes, awesome. right? Have you found, so you've got some cool technology. Are you finding some uses for that kind of outside the company and, and maybe licensing that in other ways? Well, it's interesting. We... Um, I was in New York a couple weeks ago. I was talking at a conference, and I kind of made this presentation about what we were doing and the shelfie and how this is really awesome. And afterwards, a couple of people came up to me, and they were actually book distributors to school classrooms and libraries. And they were really keen on potentially licensing our technology um, for the shelfie because it would be a way for teachers to inventory the books they have in their classroom so that they can have, and they already have an app that allows the teacher to check a book out to a student and monitor when it comes back. And they also want to know which books are on these teachers' shelves so they can say, hey, you know, for Common Core, you want to have all these other books as well. Um, so they were actually really keen on coming and, you know, potentially licensing the technology from us. Um, but given the size of our team, we're a pretty small team. You know, we, you know, a startup is the maximum number of people who can actually get behind and, and push on a single problem. Uh, we haven't really explored those in a hell of a lot of detail yet. 
Yeah, I think there's some good stuff there. I mean, I think there's going to be some interesting things, especially around the OCR technology that's there that mm -hmm. that you guys will be able to turn in other yeah. areas, find other interesting. Pro I mean, it sounds like you got some pretty smart people there. I'm just going to just going to say that you got some pretty you got some pretty smart folks. Um, well, when you think that. about what we're actually doing in OCR, we're actually breaking recaptchas. So you know those annoying distorted text yes. things? Yes. So we promise not to sell this technology to spammers. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. Yeah, you could, you could couldn't you? Yeah, because this, okay. is, this is effectively the same problem we had to solve, is, yeah. is text recognition out of a natural image. What about other languages? So books and in, 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 you know, anything other than English? So at this point, our, our matching database is driven on is English. It's the English books and print database. Uh, there's no reason we couldn't add to that if we got the, the Swedish or the German or the French books and print. We just need to add um, the special the extra characters that they will have, like the accents, um, to the to the the data recognition or sorry to the, the character recognition. And it gets a little more complicated when you start dealing with other alphabets. So you go to Greek. We have to retrain. If you go to Cyrillic alphabet, when you get into Asian countries, you're recognizing kanjis and hiragana and katagana. So it'd be much more. It would be more complicated to to move into those markets. Did you think when you were in high school that you'd be running a small business that would be scanning books? <laughs> and, and, I mean, what's what's interesting about this is it seems, and on the surface, it seems like a very simple problem, and yet you, there's a ton of very complicated technology that's going into just getting the book discovered. Mm -hmm. and 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 you know being able to take a picture of it on a shelf so that that's pretty cool no. yeah it's I, sometimes the way i describe it is it's, it's shazam for bookshelves but i don't know if you've ever looked at how complicated the shazam algorithm is it's uh it's beautifully simple and incredibly complex at the same time yeah um, that, so that the, the real smart ones are right the real hard yeah. ones it's it's the the hard part is making it simple Precisely. In, in yeah, that. the hardest so, part is making it simple. Yeah, making it making it extremely simple. Well, Peter, thanks for taking. We're right at the forty-five minute mark, and uh, and thanks for taking some time. A very interesting. I'm going to go now when we're done, and uh, I'm going to start <laughs> taking pictures of everything. Got a big bookshelf over in the other room, so I'm going to. So you'll see me. You'll start seeing oh, pictures see coming across. Come Do you have an idea how many? Uh, oh, I got one more question. Do you have any an idea of how many shelfies are coming in every day? Is that kind of a standard number? Does it spike kind of based on social? Uh, how's that working? Yeah, yeah. So we we have a pretty standard. Like the the base load is pretty. The organic growth is kind of forty percent month on month. So we do have this kind of virality around users, and I think it might be something to do with people saying the word shelfie and then people correcting them because it's just delightful to correct someone's <laughs> correcting you. Um, but uh, It's a great name, yeah. by the way. I mean, it just it, presented itself to you. It was just like, it, it just had to happen. It, it had to happen. It had to be there. It had to be there. But uh, yeah, when we do get, um, when I, I mentioned that, the, the story on Lifehacker, uh, that I, my co-founder and I, two days before Christmas, we didn't sleep for 48 hours as we were spinning up servers trying to deal with the load. So, but generally, you know, the load is pretty good. Um, we kind Amazon of Amazon do that for you? Well, the funny thing is, Amazon actually stops uh, you from spinning up servers if they think that your um, credentials have been compromised because they don't want someone breaking into your AWS account and mining bitcoins. So we actually got capped at 20 servers, and then the queue started building. And so we were on the phone to Amazon at AWS saying, look, guys, we need more servers, we need more servers, we need more servers. And we were busy setting up a Google Compute account and an Azure account and a you know a Rackspace account so that we could try and get more servers up and distribute the process out. So that was that was part of that following 48 hours. That's good. Yeah, though. generally, it's yeah. a good problem to have, right? These and, are good problems to have. And so, if in your case, those just build in a queue, and it's just a matter of time. You, you, people aren't losing their no. their uh, their pictures. It's just a matter. Of it's taking more time to get them queued up and. So I assume once you got through the bulk of that, then you you started decommissioning or turning <laughs> turning the servers we off. We started turning servers down again. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, and typically we run about fifteen servers to to keep the base load the base load running. And and what's the runway from a profitability standpoint? You're a true startup in the sense. Are you guys self funding? Do you have some some venture capital behind it? So we've um, we've self funded uh, the first year. So I, this is actually my second startup. I had a very small secondary in between the A and the B round on my previous startup. Um, so that was I was able to fund us through the first year. Um, we raised friends and family capital. We did a seed round um, that it saw us through our second year, and that's kind of where we find a bit of product market fit. We're actually I'm not allowed to say it. We're not fundraising, or I can't say that we're fundraising publicly. Right. You're not here. No, that, that's the SEC would get really upset about that. 
Um, but yeah, so we, we, do, we went through an accelerator last, uh, last spring, um, and we did have a little bit of institutional money come in then, but very, very minor. Right? Uh, so yeah, we'll be looking to do another round of financing probably this spring. Oh, well, cool. No, sounds sounds very very interesting. I I uh, so we'll we'll follow you. I would it be okay if we get down the road, or if you guys have a major kind of release or something we can talk about? Would you come back on and and? Uh, I would love it? to. Yeah, I would love yeah, to give you guys no. an update. Great. Well, hey, I Peter, I appreciate you coming on. Uh, I think a very interesting interview. It's going to lead to a discussion with my publisher at work <laughs> to say and Gallup's, I mean, we sell a few books uh, there at Gallup, so. Well, uh, it'll be interesting to see what they say there as we as we do that. But Peter, thanks for coming on. Thanks for staying uh, staying at work late. I know uh, you're gonna ride your bike home. Do you do that? Do you ride it all, all year long? Oh yeah, we we can ride all day all all year long. It's nice. raining. I actually I rode in this morning. I was soaked, um, so I'm just starting to dry out. And uh, I'm looking forward to getting wet again going home. Yeah, in Nebraska you die if you drive. <laughs> we were this morning. It was negative fifteen when. Oh, that's uh, negative fifteen on the Fahrenheit, which is the doubly cold side. Yes, really cold on the Fahrenheit side, and uh, we warmed up to a blustery five or six or something oh. today. So I do see every once in a while uh, on these really cold days, I see guys out there on their bikes, totally bundled, gloved, oh. hood, little thin, and I'm like, okay, look, you're a man. Like, yeah, <laughs> you, you win. You're the man. <laughs> <laughs> Way to do it, and uh, we're glad that you can prove it. But, uh, Peter, thanks for taking some time to come on. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and let you drop. I've got a few things to talk about here with the community okay. as we wrap this up, uh, but you don't need to stay around for that. Thanks Perfect. again. And, and, again, let me know if you've got anything new you want to talk about, any breakthroughs, any of that kind of stuff that you'd like to do. Always, You could always come back, be proactive and come back on. I'll probably ping you in the fall sometime and uh, get an update from you. Brilliant. Okay. Thanks so much. Thanks, Peter. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming on. Cheerio. Cheers. Well, that was, uh, that was pretty cool. Um, I'm going to, if you're, you know, I'm not good at this part of, uh, of talking when there's nobody else here. Usually I've got somebody with me uh, in, in the chat room or, I, or on the video here. Or so, But uh, we'll spend a little time wrapping things up. First of all, uh, I want to thank Peter Hudson for coming on uh, from BitLit. I'm, like I said, I'm going to go ahead and take pictures. You guys should, too, go out and download that app, either Android or iPhone. Go out, take some pictures. It's totally free, so you can just try it out, give it a shot. And, again, their, their stuff gets better the more uh, data they get. Uh, and so give it a shot and uh, get out there and uh, take a photo of your books. You might have some free e-books waiting for you out there, and maybe if you haven't read those yet, a good opportunity, especially some of the new ones that are out there might be available um, to you. And, of course, we'll, we'll have Peter back on maybe in the fall and see what's going on at BitLit. We've got a lot of things coming up. It's been, uh, it's been a, a busy – February is a busy month for Jim. And uh, we spend a lot of time – yeah, he did say – Ken said he did say cheerio. Um, uh, February is a busy month for me and a lot of time on the road. I spent some time in Florida down at, uh, at Gainesville this week, and we're out in Dallas uh, next week. Although Randy Cantrell, I know you were out there listening earlier, not enough time. We're in and out of Dallas, in very quickly and out, same day, not enough time. Uh, we're booked the whole day to come see it. But I will get to Dallas and come see you, Randy, uh, at some point in time. We uh, So February's a little sketchy. In fact, it's so busy, I didn't even get the newsletter out. I'll try and get that written this weekend and uh, get that out uh, to you. But uh, if you're a regular listener to, pod uh, to the podcast, we want to say thanks. Go support BitLit. Very, very interesting. I've been trying to track down our friends at RoboCopy. That has not been uh, as successful as I was hoping. And I actually tried to – I didn't realize how big my fitness pal had gotten. I, uh, I was – they're, they're on number one or two fitness app now that's out there. I had contacted uh, my fitness pal to see if they would jump on the podcast. If you have someone that you would like for me to interview and you can help me kind of broker that interview, that's always nice. Or at least just send me the name. I will. Uh, I'll track that down and try and uh, and try and get that for you. So, just let me know. Send that to. You can tweet me uh, at Jay Collison. Uh, you know, send me the email, Jim at theaverageguy.tv, and we'll see what we can do to get them tracked down. I want to say thanks for supporting the uh, the, the tech scholarship fund out there at Amazon. So, if you're going to purchase something, purchase at theaverageguy.tv/amazon. And of course, if you're in Canada, our good friend John Zadler benefits from that. And uh, he will buy stuff and test it. And uh, that's just the uh, the average guy TV slash Amazon CA. Don't forget to sign up for the newsletter if you haven't done it. We're almost up to 100 on that newsletter. So thanks, guys. One, I get one one or two a day, seems like. 
and uh, and so uh, we want to uh, we want to say thanks for doing that as well. And then uh, one last reminder: we're back on, or I'm back on, Ask the Podcast Coach for at least the next couple weeks. We've got the high schoolers back in the saddle at Gallup, and uh, we uh, will be there on Saturday. So I get them started, and then I head down to the studio there, and then uh, spend some time. Uh, podcasting 9 30 central 10 30 eastern out at askthepodcastcoach.com if you're thinking about starting a podcast by the way if you're thinking about starting a podcast uh, and you want a network to join of course you can join the geeks network if you want the geeks network.com dave and i are running that and i would love to have you on there if there's a podcast i think he says something like is there a podcast in you and so that's available out there as well. We are live. If this is your first time, I want to say thanks. Uh, we're hoping to get a little bit of traction with BitLit. They've been uh, getting some uh, some good traction out there. And if this is the first time listening, we want to say thanks for listening. Tonight, we'll actually cut this. It'll be under an hour. So if you're a regular, <laughs> Ken says he looks forward to the newsletter. If you're a regular listener and you haven't signed up for the newsletter, do that. But if you're a new, new listener, we want to say thanks. And uh, hang around. It's a great community. A bunch of great guys out there in the chat room. And um, we are out here live every Thursday night, 8 p.m. Central, just about every Thursday night, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out at TheAverageGuy.tv live. Of course, I post that when we're going to be live. I post that out on the page, so just go to TheAverageGuy.tv, look down the right-hand column. That is there. Usually I post that on the weekends for the week before, and there are some weeks in February coming up where actually I actually think it's next week or the week after. We will not be here live on Thursday, and we'll figure out uh, what to do. Other Jim says, uh, my fitness pal is owned by Under Armour. Yeah, so, you know, I didn't know any of that. I just sent him a request on Twitter. Hey, are you guys interested in doing a podcast? We'd like to talk about it. It went to their marketing group. I'm sure it will die a slow death, that uh, that request at, at uh, my fitness pal. Will uh, will not? I doubt I will get. It was like when I tried to get somebody mentioned a, a nice watch. When somebody uh, I tried to get Garmin on the program, <laughs> that, that went through like eight levels of engineers uh, before and marketing people before they would uh, even allow me to say or for them to say no. So that would have been fun. I wanted to ask Garmin some questions. Good to have him on the program. And uh, anyway, so. We'll say thanks for coming out, and uh, this will do it for tonight. Thanks for coming out. Again, every Thursday, 8 p.m. Central, 9 Eastern, out the average guy. This is really weird not having anybody to talk to, like in the in the hangout. I know you guys are out there listening. 8, uh, 8 o'clock Central, 9 Eastern, out the average guy, dot TV slash live. And with that, we'll say goodnight, everybody.